So a week ago, my uh, son Benjamin and I decided we wanted to have the flu and uh, found ourselves recovering from that early Sunday afternoon. And then by Monday, my fever had spiked again to 102, and I lived with that for two days until I went to the doctor and found out I had strep throat. That was Wednesday, and um, so I endured a bout of strep throat from Wednesday to Friday, and Saturday morning woke up, and my eyes were matted shut, and I had pink eye. (laughs) So um, really, there's only one thing left for me to get, and that's leprosy. So if while I'm preaching, my arm falls off, You'll know what it is. You don't have to worry about it. It's just a bout of leprosy. This too shall pass, okay? I don't know why I decided I needed to be sick with everything in one week, um, but obviously that postponed my surgery that I was supposed to have on Friday, and I'll have it this coming Friday. So we're a week later on our schedule, but the Lord knows all this. He is sovereign, and we rest in that and trust that His Good and pleasing and perfect will is being accomplished. I want to invite us to Luke chapter 3. Gospel of Luke chapter 3. And we'll start the reading at verse 21. We're going to look at the baptism and then temptation story of Jesus together. Um, Just some... Curious and interesting things that I think the Lord wants to show us today. Luke chapter 3, starting at verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. And then you see this long genealogy list going all the way to the end of chapter 3. Now, there's a few things about this particular story I want us to be aware of. First of all, this genealogy is going to look different than the genealogy that you see in Matthew chapter 1. At least half of it is different. And the reason is, is because Luke chooses to do the genealogy of Mary, while Matthew does the genealogy of Joseph. So it's really cool how both Gospels, when you put them together, you're going to see the lineage of Mary into Jesus, and then you'll see the lineage of Joseph um, through, through the Gospel of Matthew. So just in case you've ever noticed the difference of the names, that explains that. Now, um, I also love that in this baptism story, we see the Trinity at work. You have Jesus the person, Jesus the man, being baptized. You see the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus. The Holy Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove. And then there's a voice from heaven that speaks. And in this picture of the baptism, you see the Trinity at work. And what does God say? This is my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased, he says. Um, Now, some people think that the baptism was invented by John, John the Baptist. But we need to realize that that John the Baptist did not invent baptism. Actually, it had existed uh, for generations and that they had baptism pools there at the temple and there was a cleansing ritual that would happen prior to entering into sacrifice and worship. In fact, there was, it, it seems that there was two different forms of baptism. There was the one that Jews would do ritually speaking to become cleansed and they would walk into the pool completely and then walk out on the other side but then there was the conversion baptism those that wanted to convert to judaism they would have their ritualistic baptism experience 
where they would be baptized out of paganism into Judaism. And it seems that the baptism that John implements is sort of a mixture of the two because he's calling everyone to be baptized, but there is this baptism of repentance that is taking place in preparation for Messiah to arrive. And then, of course, when Messiah does arrive, Jesus shows up, he is baptized, he, he does the same thing. And we know from other Gospels, there's this dialogue that happens between John and Jesus. And John says, look, I'm, I'm not worthy of doing this. In fact, I need to be baptized by you. Jesus says, I must do this to fulfill all righteousness. And that's a key phrase for us because as Jesus walks through this story and then the next story that we watch him walk through, we need to understand that that is hanging over his head. He's got to walk through this. He's got to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus did not have to be baptized because of repentance. Jesus did not have to be baptized because he needed to go through a washing experience. We understand that Jesus was perfect, okay? So the baptism experience for Jesus was not because he needed it, but because he needed to do it. Does that make sense? He didn't need it, but he needed to do it to fulfill our righteousness. Let's move into chapter 4 now. (coughs) Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan where he had been baptized and was led by the Spirit into the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil he ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was hungry the devil said to him if you are the son of god tell this stone to become bread jesus answered it is written man does not live on bread alone then the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone that I want to. So, Jesus, if you worship me, this will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil led him to Jerusalem and had Jesus stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. How curious it is that then Satan now is using Scripture to tempt Jesus. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. So following this baptism story, Jesus then is led by the Spirit out into the desert where he experiences 40 days of temptation. Now, we, the temptations that we're looking at here happen at the end of the 40 days, but do know that he has been tempted all throughout the 40 days of the fasting out in the desert. And we know this because um, we find in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, let's look at that. We're going to look at a lot of different scriptures today. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says this. I'll start at verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Folks, we know that Jesus was not just tempted three times. In fact, we know if we just apply 
an ounce of logic into Jesus' story, we know that temptation didn't just begin when he walked into the desert. He was 30 years old at this point. Believe me, Jesus had experienced temptation prior to 30 years old, okay? But it's important that we understand, and especially through this story here in Luke chapter 3 and 4, that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet he was without sin. Now, let's go back to Luke chapter 4. Notice in verse 1, it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert where then He experienced temptation. Now, I'm curious. What do we understand about temptation? Where does it come from? Okay, that's two different answers. All right, so I heard... It comes from Satan, and then it comes from our own evil desires. Now, both of those answers are correct, because here's what James chapter 1, verse 14 says. James chapter 1, verse 14 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So God is not in the business of temptation. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So James is making something very clear. There there was this inward force that is at work that leads us or drags us into temptation we also know that satan is known as the tempter and he wouldn't be known as the tempter if he did not go about the business of tempting so we know there's an internal force that is at work leading us into temptation but there's also the external force that leads us into temptation i I'm intrigued at the fact that in Luke chapter 4, we see Jesus being led by the Spirit into the desert where then he experiences the external temptation of Satan. And the reason I'm wanting to point this out is because there are three people in all of history that are unique to the, in the issue of temptation to the rest of us. Jesus is one of them. But there are two others. And it's Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve and Jesus are unique to the rest of history when it comes to the issue of temptation. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, or Genesis chapter 3 actually. And I'll, I'll tell you what I'm, I'll explain what I'm talking about here. Genesis chapter 3, we'll just start right at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, so now here's the external force at work. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. and You must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the the eyes of both of them were open. They realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Here's the deal. When God created Adam and Eve, He created them in perfection. All they knew up until this point was perfection. At the point of this temptation, there was not the inward force within them dragging them into temptation. It was external only. 